Hi, and welcome to another episode of Ask Dr. Jessica. I have a wonderful guest today, Dr. Ali Strocker. She's an ENT and she practices very close to where I work. And I'm so happy to have her here. I have so many patients that see her and they're so thrilled with the care that she offers. So how are you, Ali? Nice to have you here. Uh, thank you for having me on the show and I'm very excited to be here. Tell us about what you do. You're a pediatric ENT. Um, what does that mean and, and who do you treat? So um, being a pediatric ENT means I finished my full ENT residency and then subsequently did a fellowship to specialize in care for kids. So my whole practice and my whole office is based around kids from newborns, um, I would say till 18, but honestly it goes well, well on beyond that till about 25 years or, or so. Um, Cause kids have different needs. They're not just small adults, as, as you know, as a pediatrician, right? Their, their needs are very specific. Um, so I have extra training in taking care of them and also just extra care given to the patient and to the parents. So I was thinking with summer coming up, there's a lot of questions that come up around children and protecting their ears um, between going in the pool, being on vacation, traveling on airplanes. So I wanted to ask you about how to protect our kids' ears. So the first thing that comes up a lot is swimming. Children tend to get an infection called swimmer's ear. Sometimes they get water in their ears. Do you have any general advice for parents on how to protect their children when they're swimming? Um, yeah, so yes, we're, as we move into the summer season, it's something that I start to see a lot as the kids start swimming every day and a few times a day. Um, so we get, yes, water tends to get trapped in the ear, in the outer ear canal. And because your ear canal is dark and warm, it's a perfect spot for bacteria to grow. Um, especially if kids have some earwax in their ears, it tends to sort of give almost like a food and then you have the kid starts maybe scratching at the ear, which introduces some bacteria and, and then you get a uh, swimmer's ears. So one of the best things I tell parents, as long as the child's eardrum is normal, so it's not a child who has tubes or a hole in their eardrum is you actually can use either the over the counter swimmer's ear drops, which are actually almost pure alcohol and that dries the ear out. Or you could actually make up a mixture on your own of half rubbing alcohol and half white vinegar and put a couple drops in after the day of swimming. And that'll dry the ear and reacidify the ear canal and prevent the swimmer's ear. Honestly, I usually recommend that to kids who are getting a lot of swimmer's ear because not everybody gets it. But if you have a child who is getting it at least once a summer, that might be something you want to do so that your child doesn't have to have a summer of pain. So just to clarify, you would take over-the-counter swimmer's ear drops or you'd make a formulation from home mm -hmm. and then you would put a couple drops in each ear right after swimming and for how long would the child have to stay on their side with the drops in? Um, so we, I typically say just do it at the end of the day because right, most kids are in the pool, out of the pool, in the pool, out of the pool. And so we, not every time they come out, that would be a lot. But at the end of the day, when you're done, you're packing up to go home or you're gonna go inside from swimming in your pool in your backyard, I would have them kind of lay on their side or lay across your lap, pull back on their ear, put about four or five drops in, rub it around, and then tip their head over and let it drain out. They don't need to stay there very long. You actually want it to sort of wash the ear canal and drain out to help dry it out. And, and that should be all you have to do. And what about hydrogen peroxide? That's a popular one that people use. Is that as helpful as well? Hydrogen peroxide is good for uh, buildup of excess earwax. Um, so if, you're, if your child tends to have a lot of earwax, that is something you can use. It is something you probably have to use pretty regularly because it just softens the earwax. And if you have a big mound of earwax and you soften it, guess what? It just slips into the ear canal. Um, but if you, if you notice your child tends to get a lot of earwax, yeah, once a week you can put a little hydrogen peroxide and use it to help the earwax come out. Again, I would caution you to make sure your child doesn't have ear tubes or a hole in their eardrum because otherwise those things will burn. That's a good cautionary reminder. Um, now, what about signs looking for an outer ear infection or swimmer's ear? What, what signs tip you off that a child may, may have swimmer's ear? Yeah, so um, ear, outer ear infections and swimmer's ear look very different, let's say, than from middle ear infections. So the way that we can kind of tell a lot of times just by talking to some before I even touch them is how, onset. So typically they've been swimming a lot or in the water, the lake, the ocean, something like that. And then it's really a lot more pain on the outside of the ear. So with when you have an outer ear infection like swimmer's ear, the ear canal itself swells and then that for the outer part of the child's ear gets very tender as well because it's all connected. So you can kind of tell just even by gently pulling on their outer ear. And if that hurts, that's usually a sign that there's an outer ear infection. Middle ears actually hurt more internally. So the child might complain in the back of the head or deep inside. That separates the two of those. Okay. And then just to distinguish or to clarify, 
a middle ear infection. What typically causes a middle ear infection? So middle ear infections tend to occur typically after the child's had some sort of cold. So you get a cold, you get swelling in the nose and nasal cavity, the eustachian tube, which was what drains the ear internally on the other side of the eardrum, that part, the eustachian tube gets blocked, fluid backs up into the middle ear space, and that's the middle ear infections. That's the ones we see a lot of during the winter, some in the summer as well, but when we get all the kids are getting all these viruses that are bombarding us, that's when we usually see them getting ear infections. That's a great explanation. I, I like to distinguish the two because I think it's confusing for parents, especially because with uh, with middle ear infections, we prescribe antibiotics. And for swimmer's ear, we don't prescribe oral antibiotics. Right. And that, that's a very good point. So middle ear infections must be treated with an oral antibiotic because between the outside of your ear canal and your middle ear space, you have your eardrum. So anything you put on the outside is not gonna get in there to treat that middle ear infection. Middle ear infections, whole middle ear swollen, eardrum swollen, you gotta, you gotta go internally and treat that with oral antibiotics. Outer ear infection is very different. You actually only wanna treat with drops and 99% of the time because the drops are gonna act locally, treat the infection, and usually actually oral antibiotics don't work very well. So it's only really severe cases where the, the infections actually started to spread. We get something called cellulitis, where the whole ear canal and outer ear is infected. That's the only time we usually do oral antibiotics because most of the time the drops are going to work great. Okay. Yeah. So, so and just to bring that up, you said drops. What what typical drops can parents expect as treatment for a swimmer's ear infection? Um, yeah. So this is definitely something if you think your child has swimmer's ear, you need to go see your pediatrician, or if it's really severe, come see us. Um, so we usually use, typically we use something called Cipridex, um, and there's a couple variations of that, which is a ciprofloxacin, an, an antibiotic, and a, and a steroid. The steroid is actually very integral because it helps bring down the swelling and gets the antibiotic to work. Um, and there's, they have a couple other steroids as well. There's a ciprofloxacin with triamcinolone. It's all the same thing. We're basically an, or, um, a, a ciprofloxacin, which is really good for the ear canal and to treat the ear canal infection, and the steroid to bring down the swelling. That's great. And so can children expect to feel better pretty quickly after taking the, uh, the ear drops, the Cipridex? Yeah, I would say typically within 24 to 48 hours, they should feel relief. Um, okay. So as soon as, you get, as soon as you get in to see your pediatrician, um, then you start the drops. They usually within about a day or so start to have some relief as that swelling comes down. The reason why it's painful, you have a swollen ear canal in a bony space. Now, the reason I said is if it's really severe, sometimes the pediatricians will send children to us because a lot of times we actually have to clean out the ear. If there's a lot of debris filling the ear canal, that's where I come in. I have a microscope and suction to clean out that stuff. And in really severe cases, the ear canal will swell shut and we have to put what's called a, a wick in. It's a little cotton piece, it goes down in the ear canal, helps open the ear canal and also get the drops, just like a candle, which helps the drops to get down to the deepest part of the ear canal. Wow. Got some good tricks. Okay, now a couple common questions that parents ask me with regard to swimmer's ear. Um, the first one is sometimes parents have trouble getting the drops in their children's ears. The children are, you know, they're in pain. They don't want to sit still. Do you have any advice to put in ear drops? Yeah, it can be challenging because part of that is, as I was showing before, you have to actually pull back on the ear um, itself to try and get the, the canal to open up. And if it doesn't, then that's when the, you know, the canal, the drops won't get down to the deepest part of the canal. So gently, you have to gently pull back and then do have to rub a little in the front. Now, what a lot of times what I'll do with a older child, let's say maybe five or six years old, is ask them to rub it for you. So to have them either take their hand or then and show them and they can rub it around, that rubbing, that kind of pumping motion gets the drops to go further down in the ear canal. That's a great tip. That's a great tip. It helps. Um, it's, not, it's not perfect. It's still, it's still being comfortable. And they, they can use things like Motrin and Tylenol for that first 24 hours while they're still having a lot of pain. I've also heard that you can put a cotton ball in the ear canal and then put the drops onto the cotton ball so that the child feels a little more comfortable as the, as the moisture gets into the ear canal. That's um, tip the factors you really got to make sure enough co enough drops are getting down there. So I mean, you can yes. you can sort of leave the cotton ball there afterwards. We really got to make sure you're kind of saturating it. And and the other thing is, if your their parents are really having trouble, like those drops are not going down, they're pooling. That might be time to come see me to clean out the ear, and maybe need, it maybe even need a wick if it's really um, blocked. It does sometimes happen. Um, That's but a great assuming point. it's not, and the, you're able to get those drops in, you kind of go slowly. Um, the other thing that we sometimes do recommend, um, 
is, is you're warming the drops up a little bit, put it in your pocket, and sometimes that feels better when it's not so cold to the, the body's a lot warmer, especially that ear canal is going to be hot with the infection. Um, that might feel a little bit better for them as well. Yes, or I'll say like rub, rub the drops in your hands, mm-hmm, warm it exactly. up that way. Okay, that's a good tip in the pocket. I like it. And I appreciate you saying that about the cotton ball because you're right. Uh, you have to be careful that you're getting enough medication into the ear canal. Yeah. And otherwise, you'll, you'll end up saturating the cotton ball. You'll end yes. up wasting your drops. So. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. And you'll miss the treatment. Um, okay, another common question I get about swimmer's ear. Now, a lot of these kids are avid swimmers and parents want to know when is it safe for them to get back into the pool? So you need at least probably, depending on the severity of the infection, at least probably a good five days on the drops trying to keep the ear dry. The ear is still draining a lot. The drops are struggling to get in. You're going to try and have to keep that ear dry. Once the drops are going in pretty easily and the child's no longer having a lot of pain, you can probably start to resume swimming again. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So on average, you'd say about five days. Yeah. Like. Again, depending on the severity, most of the time probably need a follow-up either with the pediatrician or with us to make sure that things are getting better and looking good and then you can resume swimming. There's nothing worse than when you tell a kid they can't go swimming and they're about to go on vacation or that they can't get their head out of the water. They look at you like you gave them the worst news. It is heartbreaking. Um, and that's one thing, too. If you if you also find your child gets a lot of ear infections, a lot of times I'll have patients come to see me in like, June before swim season starts. Let me clean out the, the ear canal. Let me get that earwax out. Um, so Because a lot of times, again, that, that earwax traps the water in there. So those kind of kids, it might be beneficial to have a good ear cleaning at the beginning of summer, hopefully decreasing the frequency of swimmer's ear. Okay, so this is really helpful. I mean, while we're on the topic of earwax, maybe we can talk about this a little bit more because I do get uh, uh, mixed messages on on earwax and when when to leave it alone, when it might be harmful for kids. So can we talk about earwax? What, what is your general feeling on earwax and when does it need to be taken care of? So yeah, earwax is normal. It's actually the ear canal's protective mechanism. It's like the oil on our skin. Some people make a lot. Some people don't make very much at all. Again, just like oily skin and dry skin. Um, so it's in, in general, earwax is not a problem. And I, I tell parents, you can clean the ear, the outside part of the ear, and just at the opening of the ear canal, because every parent, especially the moms, always want their kids to be totally clean, right? No one wants to see any wax on their kids. But don't be sticking the Q-tips down into the ear canal. And, and the reason for that is most of the time, people will end up pushing the wax in deeper and scratching the ear canal and then setting them up for an ear infection, uh, outer ear infection. So clean the outside part. If your child is one who has a lot of ear wax, and the pediatrician will clean it in their office. If it's really bad, they'll send them to us, and we're happy to, to clean ears. Um, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't usually have to be removed except for the fact for two things. One, it makes it hard for us to see, right? You have to see the eardrum. You got to know if this child has an ear infection. We need to clean the ear for that. And the other part is if the ear is very full of wax, yes, sometimes that sets them up for things like swimmer's ear because that wax is going to trap the water in, and it's, it's frustrating. If you've ever had a lot of ear wax, get some water in, you can't hear because it, it swells. So... If your child has truly excessive earwax, then we're happy to see them and clean their ears. I have patients who come once a year. Some patients come every six months or every three months if they really have a lot. So, Are there are there ways to remove wax from home? Yeah. So if your child has, you know, tends to have a lot of earwax, you can use things like Debrox, which is an over-the-counter drop. It's actually a mixture of hydro, hydrogen peroxide and some oils, basically, to soften the earwax. Um, the same caveat I mentioned before, you have to use those pretty regularly. If you, if you have a lot of wax and you put that in, it softens it, and most of the time it just loops down onto the eardrum, and then the ear canal's full. So I tell people if you want to use it once a week, remember maybe every Sunday bath, put, put that in before the kids bath, and that will keep the earwax softer and coming easier to come out. Some kids also just have very small ear canals and they're more likely to have wax get trapped. And again, that's the kind of patients we see. We're using our microscope and able to clean the ear canal and, and visualize what we're doing while we're doing it. So just to sort of clarify on how Debrox works, parents put the drops in once a week and then the earwax will soften and sort of fizzle out and, and drain on its own? Yes, exactly. So same sort of mechanism of, of applying in the drops. You put it in at the start of the bath. Um, kind of rub it around and it'll start to loosen it up. You might not see a big chunk come out, but again, this is sort of maintenance. You would do this all the time and it'll just soften the wax. And if you see stuff come out, then yes, clean the outside with either a Q-tip or a little cotton ball. Okay. 
And when a patient comes to see you for earwax removal, what can they expect? How, how do you actually remove the earwax? So we um, are fortunate we have a, I have a microscope in the office and a little uh, exam bed. Um, we lay the kid down. We actually decorate our ceiling with stickers. So we give the kids something to look at while they're lying on their back. And then using the microscope, and which allows me to use both of my hands, I can gently touch the ear, outer ear, and use a little either a curette, which is like a little tiny scoop, a little spoon, or a suction to basically remove the wax that way. It's great that you can see. It's yes. hard to see <laughs> in your canal. The visualization using a microscope, which really gives me both eyes looking, and it's, it's a lot easier than trying to do it with just an otoscope. So, or, do or you ever, flushing. Yeah, do you ever ear flush? I don't ever flush the ears. I actually kind of hate it. Um, I think it's uncomfortable for the patient. It usually like this rush of water in the air, they don't like it. And the other thing is I've seen kids get um, either traumatized from doing it, but also trauma to the ear canal. So sometimes you can get, actually get an ear infection from all that water or the, or the syringe irritating the ear canal. So I like to just do it directly visualizing what I'm doing, using the scoop or using a suction, depending on the quality of the wax. And um, usually you can get almost in every kid, get it all out in one time. Sometimes in really severe cases, I'll have parents do some deep rocks for a week or two. and then come back to for the last little bit, but that's pretty rare that that happens. That's great to soften it ahead of time. Yeah. And then come see you. No, I agree. Ear flushing. We, you know, we do have an ear flushing. Um, we do have ear flushing equipment here in the office and it works, but parents, but, but a lot of times kids don't like how it feels. They feel a little dizzy afterwards. So yeah. I'm glad that you have a more exact method. And it, it's, you know, it's something relatively simple for us to do and, and we're happy to do it. We're happy to have be that service for people to come in. It's safe and it's clean and um, kids usually do very well with it, get their lollipop on their way out and are happy. Just to clarify a myth, a lot of people like to use the, uh, the ear wax candles to get mm -hmm. wax out. Does that actually work? No, you're right, that is a myth. So basically when you use that, um, they, people say, oh, I see stuff coming out on the paper. Well, it's the wax and maybe the, from the candle, excuse me, and then maybe a little bit of wax from the inside, but you're not really getting it out and the risk of uh, burn injuries and just it's ineffective. So I've had patients say, oh, a candle and their ear canal is still full of wax. And so, so what is it exactly? They put a candle in the ear? It's like a, a little cup, basically a paper. And then, yeah, there's like a little candle and it sits in there and the candle wax melts down and warms the ear. And the theoretical thought is it pulls the wax out of the ear canal. Um, I've never seen it work. <laughs> and um, it, the idea of putting fire that close to a child's ears is, is petrifying to me. So, well, thank you for clarifying that. I, I know I, I, there's a lot of people that swear it's helping, and I think just visually they see what they think is wax, and it's not. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for that. All right. So, so, so I guess the big take-home message is if you have a lot of earwax, I would definitely go see your ENT. Yes. <laughs> or you can try Debrox first, and then see your ENT. Yeah. Um, okay, now question about travel. I get a lot of questions about how to protect ears from pressure that results from airplane rides, uh, from the ascent and the descent, or from you know from cars if someone's traveling up into the mountains. Do you have any advice for parents on how they can protect their children's ears from being uncomfortable? Uh, definitely. So, children in general have core eustachian tube function. As we get older, our eustachian tubes work a lot better. It's why everyone has been on a plane and there's a crying baby. And most of that is actually the change in pressures that's bothering their ears and they can't clear their ears like we can, popping our ears and swallowing. So um, what I usually recommend with little ones is breastfeeding or bottle feeding, especially in the descent. So when we rise up in a plane, when you go, the your pressure outside is lower than it was when you were down on the ground. So the pressure in your middle ear actually drains out, it's not It's not terribly uncomfortable. As we come down, it reverses. You go from low pressure to high pressure, and that's usually when the eardrum will now get sucked in on that low pressure, and that's when they really will cry. So most important is trying to get the little infants on the breast or the bottle for the descent, because um, they're too young to really understand. Your older toddlers and preschoolers, sit, um, you have those little juice boxes, get them in the airport, because you can't travel with the volume of liquid, but pick up a little juice box, have them suck from a straw. Same thing, that swallowing really helps. So I tell people, as soon as the plane starts to go down, just have them start taking sips all the way down until the plane lands. Um, obviously, older kids, you can do the chewing gum and sucking on lollipops and those sorts of things. 
again, the swallowing is really what opens the eustachian tube up. Um, if your child has a little bit of a cold while you're flying, uh, you can use a little um, nasal spray, like something called neosinephrine, which is like Afrin. They have a mild version. So again, they would only use that in the case of a child who's actually sick. Um, that'll help decongest the nose to help that eustachian tube as well. Okay, and that child you would spray in the nose yeah, uh, right the before of, descent? Yeah, so exactly. So if it's a long flight right before descent, if you're doing a short flight, let's say from here to San Francisco or something like that, you could probably do it at the start because those medications last for a few hours. That's really helpful. Yeah. I'm just thinking, I remember many of plane flights where my ears felt so uncomfortable as a kid. Yeah. And, and it works for adults too. So if you're flying and you have either bad allergies or a little bit of a cold when you're flying, then yeah, you can use a little bit, like a little spray of Afrin. That'll just help unblock the, the nose and unblock the eustachian tube for the descent. But the real key that I do every time I fly is I get a bottle of water in the airport. And as soon as I feel the plane going out, I just keep drinking. Because even, even as an adult, that, that pressure is not very comfortable. So, so continued sips. Okay. Yeah. I got it. That's good. Um, yeah. And I know sometimes patients will ask me about taking medications like Benadryl or I guess pain relievers could be helpful potentially, but yeah, you can use some pain relievers. You can use things like Benadryl or, um, but the, really the thing is like, it, it would have to be like a Sudafed type of medication and we don't really love using those in kids or even in adults for that matter. So unless the child was really sick, which hopefully you wouldn't be flying anyhow, um, it's not really going to be very helpful. If there are something called earplanes, um, that I know some people use, it's basically like a little earplug you put in your ear. And some people have really bad eustachian tube function to, um, to discover that that actually helps a little bit. It basically helps modulate that change in pressure so there's not as much pull on the eardrum. Um, probably not, obviously you can't use it on a baby or a toddler, but again, that the older child, you know, seven, eight years old and beyond, who's still really struggling with the pressure, you can, you can purchase those. Another question that comes up a lot children will have ear infections and parents are concerned about the flight. Do you usually tell parents that they can't fly or can fly when they have an ear infection? So if your child has an ear infection, I recommend not flying. And I've actually had this happen with my own daughter um, because when you have a middle ear infection, so like we're talking about, this is different than the outer ears. People will come to me and their child has swimmer's ear. Can we fly? Yes, you can fly with swimmer's ear because that's the outer ear. We're not worried about the eardrum and the middle ear space. Um, but if it's a middle ear infection, so your child had a cold, they got congested, boom, fluid got up in the middle ear, it got infected. Well, what happens is that your station tube gets blocked by the infection. Your eardrum is now bulging, almost like imagine a big pimple. So you have all this pus in the middle ear, that eardrum bulges out. If you go up in the plane and that all those pressure changes we talked about happen, a couple things can happen. The eardrum can actually rupture. The pressure gets so intense, the eardrum will pop, which although that sounds awful, is actually the best of all case scenarios because the infection will then drain out into the ear canal. But the bad scenarios are that pus under pressure in that middle ear space can actually break through the other way. So it can actually injure your, your inner ear and that actually can cause permanent hearing loss. Um, it can oh. also travel upwards into the bone in the, and right above your ear is your brain. So we see this every once in a while, kids will have infection or up in, underneath the brain in the, the sinuses, the little blood vessels that drain the ear up there. And they're, they're life-threatening. These are things where kids have to get hospitalized. They have to get drained. So if your child has a, a new ear infection, unfortunately, no no air travel until the infection resolves. Now, Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> Don't want that. Yeah, no, you definitely get go see your you know, pediatrician, get on antibiotics right away. Now, after a few days, when the infection is now cleared, that pus is no longer under pressure, we look, we see, we might still see a little bit of fluid in the ear. Um, but we don't no longer see pus or a red eardrum, then it actually is okay to fly. Your child might be more uncomfortable because of the pressure there, but that risk that I was describing where the infection could spread or rupture the eardrum or damage the inner ear, that risk is now gone. So it sounds like it might be a good time to see your pediatrician if you're not sure, because if it's slightly red or there's not pus behind the eardrum, it sounds like it's okay to fly. But yes. if, if there's significant fluid, pus, you don't want to go no, and don't risk go, that. Exactly. So I'll, when patients... I sometimes end up coming to see us with an active ear infection, treat them with antibiotics. You know, if they have a flight coming up, all right, let me see you back before then, you know, to make sure it's resolved before you get on the plane. Okay. No, very helpful advice. Um, now, speaking of uh, keeping the ear safe, sometimes I'll have patients uh, very typically or more, more typically than, than you might expect, 
uh, or not you expect, Dr. Strucker, but, but people listening, where kids like to put objects in their nose, in their ears. Um, when children put things in their ears, is that a reason to see an ENT right away? Or are there ways that parents can try at home to remove things from the ears? What's your advice? Um, so it, yes, it is actually quite common. We see this a, a lot. And actually my husband, who's not medical at all, was shocked once we were together how frequently I got this phone call about something in the ear or something in the nose. He never realized that this was a thing. But after being with me for a short while, he realized, yes, this happens quite a bit. I see at least a couple times a month. Um, why kids do it? We don't know. The hole's there, right? It's fun. It's interesting. Like it's, Let's explore our bodies. Um, most of the time, it's not an emergency. So what I, would rec- what I recommend is wait, call us first thing in the morning. My staff knows right away. We'll find you a slot that same day. We'll get you in um, to remove whether it's from the ear or from the nose because most of the, it's not going to go anywhere. It's usually stuck. If you go rush off to the ER, unfortunately, you're going to end up probably sitting around. Obviously, right? There's a lot of stuff going on in the ERs right now. They got, it's not a high, super high priority. And the other thing is they don't have the same equipment. So again, I have my microscope for the ear, for the nose. I have multiple different devices to be able to take whatever the object is. Usually it's a bead or a piece of food. You get all those things out. Um, The only caveat, the only time where I tell people you really do need to go right away to seek medical attention, whether from ER or pediatrician or something that day, is if it's a battery. So those small coin batteries, they're a huge danger anywhere they go. But even in an ear canal or in a nose, the acid inside the battery can leak out and it can damage the ear canal skin or can damage the nose, the septum, the cartilage in there. So if you think your child may have put a small coin battery, the little disc batteries, right away see your pediatrician come call us same day but for your child who maybe put a bead in their in their nose and it's saturday afternoon you can wait call us monday morning and we can get you in and get that out that's great advice so if it's if there's a battery in the ear in the nose that's an emergency where you want to see an ent or go to the emergency room but otherwise it can wait until your office set is open yes sounds like okay. <laughs> no i have to tell you there's so many times i've been surprised where i'll do a routine you know, physical examination, I'll look in the ear and lo and behold, there's a, there's a Lego or there's something shiny or there's some Play-Doh. So I'm definitely, <laughs> I'm surprised at how often things are put in the ears and nose, but it, it is. I mean, kids, I will never forget um, when I was in training um, up at all of you medical center and there was, we got this urgent consult. There was a child that they thought had a tumor in the ear. They actually even had done an MRI, all this stuff. And it was a very, you know, small tumor located in the ear canal. And when I got my microscope and looked, I said, mm, I got this and slid it out. And what it was was the top of a little pencil eraser. But no one, the kid didn't say anything. They had gone for routine physical. The pink fleshy thing looked like a tumor, right? This whole process had happened. The mom's in tears thinking her child's, a, you know, I'm going to give her a death, you know, like a cancer diagnosis for a child. And then I said, well, here's here's your little ear eraser. And obviously there was, t- you know, tears of joy at that point. But you know, it's funny. It, it is very common. They put stuff in their ears and nose. That's why we love kids, right? It's, yes. always, uh, <laughs> it's always interesting. It's always interesting. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, is any, any other words of advice that I didn't ask you that you want to offer to any parents listening? Um, you know, I think I can't think of anything in particular. I mean, I do always say to parents trust their instincts. I, I, they really never run, you know, go wrong. If you think there's something wrong with your child, see your pediatrician, come see us directly. If you, if you really feel like it's an ear or nose issue, um, I think parents intuition is, is really something, uh, remarkable. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, I think we kind of covered all our bases today. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. 